in Philip K. Dick's novel, The Android's Dream of Electric Sheep, one of the important characters is this fellow John Isidore, who is classified as a special. And the way that Dick structures the book, it's always centered on a particular character. In the majority of the chapters, it's Rick Deckard, the main character of the entire novel, but Isidore is the other character that Dick does this with. So even though there's characters that are very important to the story, like for example, Rachel Rosen, she doesn't get the same sort of treatment that Isidore does. And by comparison to Rick, who's at least not a special and, you know, is fairly astute, pretty good at his job, Isidore represents a different kind of humanity. And we should begin uh, in chapter two at the very beginning. There's some exposition about the world that they're living in, this setting in which most of the animals have died off because of radioactive dust. And it goes on and says, loitering on earth potentially meant finding oneself abruptly classified as biologically unacceptable, a menace to the pristine heredity of the race. Once pegged as special, a citizen, even if accepting sterilization, dropped out of history. He ceased, in effect, to be part of mankind. And yet persons here and there declined to migrate. That, even to those involved, constituted a perplexing irrationality. Logically, every regular should have emigrated all ready. And you know, so why are people staying there on Earth? In any case, thousands of individuals remain, most of them constellated in urban areas where they could physically see one another, take heart at their mutual presence, those appeared to be the relatively sane ones, like Rick Deckard and his wife. And in dubious addition to them, occasional peculiar entities remained in the virtually abandoned suburbs. John Isidore, being yammered at by the television set in his living room as he shaved in the bathroom, was one of these. So we're learning a lot already. Isidore himself has been classified as a special, which means that he's got distorted genes, he's not supposed to breed, he's not supposed to go off world. And things are a little bit worse for him in that he has recently failed a very important test. So John Isidore is watching TV and he thinks, um, you know, worry has gone away for me without having to emigrate. He had been a special now for over a year, not merely in regard to the distorted genes he carried. Worse still, he'd failed to pass the minimum mental faculties test, which made him in popular parlance a chicken head, a derogatory term. Upon him, the contempt of three planets descended, Earth, Mars, and perhaps, you know, another one in the solar system. However, despite this, he survived. So he's, he's stuck on Earth. He can't emigrate. He's living in an apartment building way out in the suburbs by himself. And, you know, he's in kind of a, if not rough, but we could call it stagnant spot. But he can hold a job. And this is important for his life and, you know, for engaging with other human beings. Like, like it says here, he had a job driving a pickup and delivery truck for a false animal repair firm, the Van Ness Pet Hospital, and his gloomy Gothic boss, Hannibal Sloat, accepted him as human, and this he appreciated. Um, Mr. Sloat is, is you know, treating him as if being a special is not quite so special, although he's going to call him a chicken head a little bit later on. And so, you know, this is in, in already in chapter two, we've got this character introduced. Then um, we could look immediately, if we were following uh, sequentially, at his engagement with the first android that he encounters, uh, Pris Stratton, who's going to claim first that she's actually Rachel Rosen. But we'll look at that in a bit. Let's think about this Van, ne Van Ness Pet Hospital and the scene that we encounter. So he picks up 
a, the first malfunctioning animal for the day, an electric cat. It lay in the plastic dustproof carrying cage at the rear of the truck and panted erratically. You'd almost think it's real, Isidore observed as he headed back to the Van Ness Pet Hospital, that carefully misnamed little enterprise which barely existed in the tough competitive field of false animal repair. So we should pause on this for a moment. Human beings value having animals. Animals are expensive and rare. And as we see with Rick Deckard talking about his uh, first sheep and then the electric sheep that he replaced it with, animals are pretty subject to getting themselves into illness and uh, death and all sorts of problems. So a lot of people have false animals, but they don't want to reveal that they're fake, that they're electric. So instead they, they have this service come and pick them up take them back to the shop, do whatever needs to be done, you know, recalibrate things, change the batteries and stuff like that. And so we've got this, well, what seems to be at first, a, it's described as false and electrical cat, but it's not really that way. And Isidore is talking to the cat. He says, can you hang on till we reach the shop? I'll recharge you while we're on route. And he tries to find the place where the charger would be. Um, says, uh, it would have fooled me as he groped within the Erzat stomach fur for the concealed control panel, plus the quick charge battery terminals. He could find neither, nor could he search very long. The mechanism had almost failed. The cat has, you know, got bubbles coming out of its mouth and is, is, you know, whining and stuff like that. And then the, the false cat ceases functioning. So evidently the short, if that was what ailed the thing, had finished off the power supply and basic drive train. And he thinks that's going to run into some money. So he drives there and he drops the cat off with Hannibal Sloat and Milt. And Sloat says, what do you got there? He says, a cat with a short in its power supply. And Sloat says, why show it to me? Take it down in the shop to Milt. But he opens it up and then he's examining it and he says, this isn't a, a fake cat. This is a real cat. And then he says to Milt, the chicken had brought it in. And Milt says, if it was still alive, we could take it to a real uh, animal vet. I wonder what it's worth. And Isidore says, doesn't your insurance cover this? And Sloat says, yeah, the insurance covers this. That's, that's not the point. Don't you understand? Uh, he says, it's the waste that gets me, the loss of one more living creature. Couldn't you tell, Isidore? Didn't you notice the difference? Isidore says, I thought it was a really good job, so good it fooled me. I mean, it seemed alive and a job that good. And then Milt says, I don't think Isidore can actually tell the difference. To him, they're all alive, false animals included. He probably tried to save it. What did you do? Try to recharge its battery? or locate a short in it. And, um, you know, this is kind of telling us something about Isidore himself. He feels empathy towards all sorts of living things, and he can't tell the difference effectively between artificial life, fake life, electric life, later on, android life, and genuine living organic animals. Um, Milt goes on and he says, it probably was so far gone it wouldn't have made any difference anyhow. Let the chicken head off the hook. And you notice that he's also using this term. He's got a point. These fakes are beginning to be darn near real. What with these disease circuits, they're building into the new ones. And living animals do die. That's one of the risks in owning them. We're not used to it because all we see is fakes. And Sloat says, the goddamn waste. And then uh, Isidore says, according to Mercer, all life returns. The cycle is c c complete for uh, animals too. I mean, we all ascend with him, die. And then Sloat says, tell that to the guy who owned the cat. Now, this is an offhand remark, but Isidore is not good at picking up the difference between those and serious remarks. And he says, you're not going to make me make the video call. And Sloat and Milt go back and forth about this. And Sloat, in fact, makes Isidore call up the owner, uh, the 
Pilsens and Mrs. Pilsen, described as a middle Europeisha, somewhat careful looking woman who wore her hair in a tight bun. And um, they go back and forth, and Isidore says, Oh, you know, your cat has died. Um, and then he starts going off script a little bit, says, you know, we'll replace it. And Sloat says, we'll, we'll give them a check. Uh, Isidore says, we'll, we'll personally pick out the replacement cat for you. Having started a conversation which he could not endure, he discovered himself unable to get out. What he was saying possessed an intrinsic logic, which he had no means of halting. He, it had to grind to its own conclusion, both uh, Mr. Sloat and Milt Borogrove stared at him as he rattled on. Just give us the specifications of the cat you desire. So he's he's like now off, you know, making decisions for the company, and pretty soon the owner is going to have to intervene. But it is also sort of a affirming process for Isidore to engage in. He doesn't think he's up to it, and he he is up to it. So it's kind of an interesting. Uh, passage there. Let's jump into talking about the androids now. So the first one that he meets is Pris Stratton, and this is happening uh, back earlier in uh, chapter six. He hears a TV set in his apartment building, and he says, wow, somebody else is here. So he goes to visit, and what we see is a Fragmented and misaligned shrinking figure, a girl who cringed and slunk away and yet held on to the door as if for physical support. Fear had made her seem ill. It distorted her body lines, made it appear as if someone had broken her and then with malice patched her together badly. Her eyes, enormous, glazed over fixedly as she attempted to smile. Uh, Isidore says, you thought no one lived in this building. You thought it was abandoned. The girl says, yes. And then Isidore says, it's good to have neighbors. Heck, until you came along, I didn't have any. And that was no fun, God knew. And she says, you're the only one in this building. And they, they talk back and forth. He's um, you know, trying to explain to her the apartment building, the notion of kipple or entropy that fills up all these things, how kind of scary it is to be in a place all by yourself. And then you know, they have this interesting exchange uh, where she first tells him, when he you know, tells her his name, that her name is Rachel Rosen. And then she, of course, has to take it back when he points out you know, that, the Rosen Corporation. And she says, my name is Pris Stratton. Um, you better address me as Miss Stratton because we don't really know each other. Uh, in chapter 13, we return to discussions between them. And she tells him that she is actually being hunted by these bounty hunters. She says that a bounty hunter is a professional murderer who's been given a list of those he's supposed to kill. He's paid a sum. $1,000 is the going rate, I understand, for each he gets. Usually he has a contract with the city. And it, <clears throat> so she says um, he has incentive. He enjoys it. And Isidore says... I think you're mistaken. Never in his life had he heard of such a thing. He says, it's not in accord with present-day Mercerian ethics. All life is one. No man is an island, as Shakespeare said in, in olden times. And she says, John Donne. And then Isidore says, that's worse than anything I ever heard of. Can't you call the police? I mean, the irony, of course, here is the police are the bounty hunters, or at least a certain subclass of them. So no, of course she can't call the police because she is being hunted by the police. And he says, and they're after you? They're apt to come here and kill you? No wonder you're scared and don't want to see anybody. But he thought, it must be a delusion. She must be psychotic with delusions of persecution, maybe from brain damage due to the dust. Maybe she's a special. And then he's very chivalrous. He says, I'll get them first. I'll get a permit for a laser beam, and I'll, I'll, I'll kill them before they, they get you. And she's, you know, rather skeptical of that. He also tries to feed her, um, and you know, that's, they don't really need to eat, so it's not much of a, a exchange. And then the Beatys arrive, Roy and Irmgard Beatty, two more people, uh, Pris's friends, and they start having some discussions about, well, what should they do? 
Pris herself is kind of a snob, right? As Irmgard tells her. Uh, and she doesn't want to move in with Isidore because he's a chicken head. And she, she holds that in contempt. But the Beatties suggest, no, no, you really should. And we'll all actually move in uh, together. And then um, we, we find out that uh, there's a whole bunch of other things that are going on. They begin talking about um, the bounty hunters some more and who's been killed, who's in the hospital, um, how things worked. And again, um, Isidore is starting to suspect something and um, Pris is going to tell Isidore for a short time Roy Beatty is as crazy as I am. Our trip was between a mental hospital on the East Coast and here. We're all schizophrenic with defective emotional lives. Flattening of affect, it's called, and we have group hallucinations. Isidore is very relieved. He says, I didn't think it was true. And she says, well, why didn't you? And he says, things like that don't happen. The government never kills anybody for any crime and mercerism. And then we get some interesting discussion here. So she says, Pris says, you see, if you're not human, it's all different. And um, Isidore says, well, that's not true. Even animals, even eels and gophers and snakes and spiders are sacred. And she says, so it can't be, can it? As you say, even animals are protected by law. All life, everything organic that wriggles or squirms or burrows or flies or swarms or lays eggs. And Roy Beatty comes in and says, uh, um, insects are especially sacrosanct. Now, what life isn't sacrosanct? Android life, right? Animals are, human beings are. And uh, Isidore starts to piece together that they are actually androids. That He says, you're androids, but he didn't care. It made no difference to him. I see why they want to kill you. Actually, you're not alive. Everything made sense to him now. The bounty hunter, the killing of their friends, the trip to Earth. And... Um, you know, Isidore says, you're intellectual, you think abstractly and you don't. I wish I had an IQ like you, then I could pass the test, I wouldn't be a chicken head. I think you're very superior, I could learn a lot from you. And Pris says, he doesn't understand yet how we got off of Mars, what we did there. And uh, Irmgard says, I don't think we have to worry about Mr. Isidore. Um, they don't treat him very well either, as he said. And what we did on Mars, he isn't interested in. He knows us and likes us, and an emotional acceptance like that, it's everything to him. It's hard for us to grasp that, but it's true. And she says, Isidore, you realize you could turn us in and get a lot of money, right? And she says to Roy, see, he realizes that, but he wouldn't say anything. Roy says, if he was an android, he'd turn us in, you know, in, in a heartbeat, actually, tomorrow morning. And so Isidore has, you know, worked out a kind of arrangement with these androids and they're cool with him and he's cool with them until something happens. It's not the revelation that on the part of Buster Friendly that mercerism is a fake, is a swindle and all that. It's rather what they do with a spider. And what this shows is the lack of empathy, right? Chris says, I've never seen a spider. All those legs. Why does it need so many legs, JR? And Isidore says, that's the way spiders are. And then Pris says, you know what I think, JR? I think it doesn't need all those legs. Eight, Irmgard Beatty said. Why couldn't it get by on four? Cut four off and see. And then a weird terror strikes Isidore. He's now realizing what these androids are capable of, they lack empathy towards other life, and they have a mixture of curiosity and cruelty that is going to be taken out on this poor spider whose legs they snip off and then you know try to burn in order to make move. And he ends up taking the spider and drowning it. Now, he also has an interesting interlude with Mercer, where uh, Mercer is going to, he ascends to the tomb world, Mercer's there, <coughs> gives him the spider back. He comes back to the world of, you know, uh, the apartment building. 
And then um, he meets up with the bounty hunter. He's out in the hallway and he puts the spider down. Um, here we go. He deposited the spider. He experienced its wavering progress as it departed his hand. Well, that was that. He straightened up. And then uh, a flashlight appears. The man holding the flashlight said, what did you do? I put down a spider so it could get away. And they have a brief exchange. And uh, Isidore says, if I took it back up to the apartment, she'd cut it apart again bit by bit to see what it did. And the man says, androids do that. He shows his badge and he says, you know, are they up there, the three? Um, and Isidore won't go up to help him out. Um, and so, you know, that is almost the end. After Rick kills the remaining three androids in Isidore's apartment, um, Isidore says, um, I'm leaving this building. I'm going to live deeper in town where there's more people. Rick says, I think there's a vacant apartment in my building. And Isidore says, I don't want to live near you. And Rick says, go outside or upstairs. Don't stay in here. The special floundered, not knowing what to do. A variety of mute expressions crossed his face, then turning, he shuffled out of the apartment, leaving Rick alone. And that is the last that we see of John Isidore. But he's been a very important character for interacting with the androids and giving us a sense about what life is like for somebody who isn't you know, higher up in the social hierarchy, like a bounty hunter, but somebody who is indeed a special. So interesting and uh, quite central character without being the main character of the work.